Hello, and welcome back to the Security Metrics Podcast. I'm Jen Stone. I'm one of the principal security analysts here at Security Metrics. Today, we're going to talk about social engineering, and I'm super stoked to have a uh, sec security professional and social engineering enthusiast, uh, Nathan Cooper. Nathan is uh, sp has spent his last five and a half years working at Lucid Software, which produces an enterprise visualization platform leading their technical security team. Prior to that, he worked at Novell for about eight years while finishing up his master's of information systems management degree at Brigham Young University. And he's a longtime Utah native and spends a lot of good time with his wife, four kids, and two dogs at home. Nathan, thank you so much for showing up and doing this podcast with me. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here, Jen. Thank you for having me. Do you want to tell people a little bit about yourself beyond the very uh, the bio that I hope I didn't mess up too badly? <laughs> No, no, it was perfect. It's always flattering to hear somebody else describe me in that way. Um, <laughs> and there were no four-letter expletives, so yeah. it was even better. So, uh, yeah, so I got into security quite a while ago. I was actually in elementary school when I realized that I could get onto my friends' accounts just by watching them type in their passwords. I had a quick eye, and they were slow typers, so <laughs> it led to some early adventures. Uh, that later... seems ill-advised. <laughs> well, our... yeah. It, probably yes, yeah. probably yes. And I'm sure that were my son or daughter to do the same thing, I would, I would give them a very stern reprimand and then pat myself on the yeah, back. Yeah, even secretly yeah. in your heart of hearts, you'd be like, <laughs> yeah, 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 good job. <laughs> no. uh, so my, my uncle then like sent me a, a lock picking set later on in life. And you know I got into some security classes in college and it was just magic. Uh, you know, security is magic. Mm -hmm. I, I had someone say to me the other day, this is hard. It's just really hard. And what I explained to them is it's, it's not. It's actually not hard. It's, it's unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. Security is, it, it affects all of us, especially the topic we're talking about today, social engineering. And I'm hoping that we give people enough familiarity with it that they don't feel like it's hard anymore. And, and another thing is that it applies to everyone and especially to people's people who are not as familiar or comfortable with technology. If you have those people in your life, you can take these concepts and help them uh, understand them, share them with them. So hopefully this will be helpful to various people today. But well, I hope so. Tell us, first of all, what is social engineering? Okay, so you've got normal engineering, which is where you apply expertise to a system to cause it to do some sort of function, right? Social engineering is doing the exact same thing except with people. Right? And we have tons of social engineers and have had for you know as long as people have been around. Usually we call them like psychologists <laughs> because they are getting you to do things that you would not otherwise do. Right. And they're using different techniques. So there's a bunch of different um, techniques though that bad guys will use in order to get us to do things that would actually harm ourselves mm -hmm. we would not normally do so social engineering can either be for good like my gym coach gets me mm -hmm. to do stuff that I, don't, I can't do that and he somehow gets me to do it um, and it benefits me mm -hmm. but then there's people who do it for malicious reasons and sometimes those are the hackers those are the people that were we're gonna maybe talk a little bit about that today so that people know how to protect themselves from it in the cyber world right mm -hmm. yeah and so at a, at a very base level a uh, very common in almost all social engineering attacks is this idea of pretexting, which is where you are pretending, making up a history that is not real about yourself. You're pretending to be someone else. You're putting on a disguise uh, of sorts. And then you apply that and, and certain other like stimuli, pressures, environmental pressures usually, to cause somebody to react in the way that you want them to do. So kind of like, you know, burning bait or burning building scenario where people are going to run for their values, valuables, uh, show you where those are, or they're going to divulge their credit card information uh, to avoid some negative consequence or obtain some positive result. Okay. All right. So, so it's a, a pressure to make uh, somebody do something that you want them to do or to give you access to something that you want to have. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about... A lot of times when people think social engineering, they're like, uh, this is very, uh, it happens in, in, in the digital world, but there's a lot of physical techniques that, that social engineers can use. 
Tailgating, for example. Mm -hmm. What can you tell me about tailgating? So tailgating is about as simple as it goes. And as anybody who ever like tried to sneak into a movie can tell you, you know, it can sometimes work out, sometimes not. Really depends on the people that you're working with. It, it is very simply following somebody who uh, into a place where you could not otherwise go. So maybe you're pretending like you're a relative of this individual who's going in the door, or you're just standing so close to them that people think you're somehow associated. Uh, it works particularly well if you're tailgating somebody who really wants to avoid confrontation because they're not going to turn around and tell you, hey, you know, six feet back, please, unless, of course, they think you have COVID. Um, <laughs> yeah, 2020 changed a lot yeah. of that for us. <laughs> but, but no, uh, uh, like people will actually hold the door for other people, even when everybody is supposed to badge in. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I've seen this um, personally because people hold the door for me all the time and we have badge readers. Like, so ha how do we pre prevent that? Like, what, what stops that? Because like you said, there's ways that the individual can maybe go, hey, back off, you cannot come in on, under my badge, but we're not really geared for that. You right? know, it, it's totally about training people what is and is not normal. Now, social engineering is super cool because it relies on like three main things. Uh, there's uh, helpfulness, trust, and greed. And, you know, people in a workplace like this are gonna be very helpful. Yeah. They're, you know, everybody's friendly and they want to help out their coworkers, and so they're going to do things like hold open the door um, but sometimes that works to the detriment of the company or even to the individuals like at our company we we tell people that hey if you let somebody in against company policy then whatever they're doing is you know on your head be it right. kind of thing um, don't do it and so you need to train people what the norm is uh, don't let them establish a norm naturally because they're wonderful and I'm so glad that we're this way. Their kindness is going to produce suboptimal results in this case. Right. And, and I think training is, depending on the risk of the training not working, um, if it's a high risk situation like data centers, mm -hmm. they will have additional protections in place yeah. to, to prevent tailgating, even if the people are trained well. They don't want to have to just rely on that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so man traps is one of them. And uh, I know about the man traps personally because usually it's like, it sounds like a really scary term, but it's not. It's just where you have to go into one set of doors, that doors has to close, something has to happen, some type of a, a authorization has to happen before the next set of doors can open, right? Mm -hmm. Well. I was the the worst man trap I ever experienced was in Singapore. I had to go check out a data center. And in order to go from the front lobby area into the more protected area, you had to go through a man trap, but it was not like a man trap I have ever experienced before. <laughs> it was like this col clear column that you had to step into and it had the outside would turn. So when it was turned in a certain way, it lined up so that there was entry from one direction and you'd go in and the person on the outside would turn this column and then if they turn it all the way around then you could e exit it into the the secure area well but you had there was no way if they decided they just wanted to turn it halfway and walk away you would be stuck in this tiny little column worst most claustrophobic man trap ever hated it that and sounds i don't awful. and i don't think everybody <laughs> needs that either like that level of of absolute protection against tailgating probably is overkill in a lot of situations. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, that would not fly. Uh, that would not fly at my company because it is not worth the risk. Like uh, all these security controls we're going to talk about, they have a cost, right? Sometimes it's actual physical money. Sometimes it is morale. Like right. it, and it can happen. And you know, as wonderful as a man trap may be at preventing things, it's never going to be foolproof. Like I had a presenter who is telling us about, uh, I think it was a government institution that he was evaluating from a physical pen test perspective. And he said that they had this really fancy pen test, or this band trap up in the front of the building. And he walked into it and they were showing him around. And he, it was very, very impressive. But he noticed that there was a lot of large furniture, you know, around the building. And obviously that furniture didn't come in through the man trap. <laughs> So, so clearly there was another big, like a loading dock or something. Uh-huh. And exactly that, actually. He went to the loading dock, put on a FedEx hat, and then walked into the building, was able to go through you know, everywhere that he wanted to, 
and then handed them a report at the front and said, here, here's your grade. <laughs> It must have been really disheartening for people who, if they have to have a man trap, if it has to be that secure and it's so easily breached, then uh, that's always dis disheartening for the people who are undergoing that sort of, mm -hmm. of a test. Um, yeah. I think a, a, a less um, enforcement type of man trap would be like turnstiles, mm -hmm. right? So. Yeah. So anything that can just cause people to go in through kind of a unified direction and allow you a moment to pause and make sure that people aren't going into it at a time, that kind of thing. Uh, badge readers are good for most companies. Again, they're not perfect. They're not gonna keep out a determined attacker. Mm -hmm. But then again, most of us are not being faced by determined attackers. A lot of this stuff, it's kinda like, kinda like fences. They're there to make, keep good neighbors, right? Same thing with a lot of badge readers. Uh, that said, if you are keeping valuables in an accessible location, so you've got like laptops or something, mm -hmm you should be using something else other than just a badge reader probably right. to keep people from just walking in because it's really easy to get past a badge system, yeah. <laughs> especially if there's people involved. Uh, right, because you can tailgate, you can walk around turnstiles. Mm -hmm. a, there are a lot of ways you can get past things, but that's why we talk about defense in depth. Yep. But then again, also to your point, if it's not a high risk situation, the morale for really locking down access probably is, is a trade-off that needs to be considered. Yeah, absolutely. But again, we're, there's, a, there's a bunch of different things that we can talk about in terms of social engineering. Like there's water hole attacks. Mm -hmm. So there, there's physical water hole attacks where you know that people congregate and that, that's outside of the secure zone and you can leave things for them there or combine it with tailgating. Go out and find people who have congregated outside of a building and then just walk inside as though you're part of the group somebody will probably be holding the door for you. So when you talk about for this water hole attack, mm -hmm. so basically it's like out in the wild, the lions wait at the water hole mm -hmm. because that's where the prey is going to come and then they're gonna get a meal, right? Yep. So in, in terms of a water hole attack, that's the, the physical time that thing that you were talking about, leaving something there, what kind of a thing would be left in a water hole attack? All sorts of things could be there. Um, the most common, though, would probably be USB devices because this is something that they can then plug into their computer and heavens knows, we are a curious people. Um, I think security True. experts probably know that better yeah. than anyone. And if I have a USB device, I'm going to use a throwaway machine. <laughs> but, but I'm probably going to find a way probably to plug gonna, it in somewhere. Yeah. Um, but not everybody's going to be very careful with that. And if that device can then act like a human interface device, like a mouse or a keyboard, and then you know execute some commands really quickly, or contain you know malware-laden uh, files on it, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing, somebody's probably going to stumble upon it. Maybe it says like confidential on it. That's well, now sometimes you're not a deterrent. Yeah, <laughs> confidential. Mm, that sounds like something I want to see. Want to see? So this was like made very famous in the public eye through the Stuxnet attack, which was against an Iranian uh, nuclear facility, and they had some engineer who found some USB device around his house, and then took it into the facility and plugged it in. It was an air gap situation, so there was no network connectivity in and mm. out but somebody carried in a USB drive. Well, there, so a lot of the, the organizations that I work with don't allow reading off of a USB drive for that reason, mm -hmm. but then it also makes it harder to share pictures of your like vacation with everyone. <laughs> so <laughs> um, depending on if people need USB for a job related reason, you might lock that down. Mm -hmm. Again, if you lock down too much, it can hit the morale of people but I think USBs are something that we don't necessarily all need to have in our laptops. And, and, and the potential to introduce um, malware is, it can be pretty high. Yeah, and especially not all the time. Like we don't, we don't need USB all the time. If you're switching laptops, maybe you need to back up things. But again, it might be better to have a cloud solution to do that kind of thing. Right. So. You know, there's also the, um, the digital type of, of a waterhole attack where Let's say an attacker knows that a certain type of person is tends to go to a certain type of website. They're mm -hmm. going to do their best to get to that website, put malicious software on there so that they can then infect usually government um, entities to, to, to breach their, their um, uh, systems. 
Um, and I was reading up on on waterhole attacks uh, after you mentioned the Stuxnet one because I love that story. I've heard it on I think Darknet Diaries does a really good um, uh, verse of it. Um, the the um, types of waterhole attacks are often um, state driven, and I mean it always sounds so. Ooh, now you're trying to scare everybody. State well, entity. <laughs> state state entities going after people, but, and yet that's one of the ways that they do is they know that the targets that they have will tend to frequent certain sites. If they can put some malicious code in that site and then have what we call a drive-by download, I don't know if all of our listeners knew that, but you can actually, in some situations, just by going to the page, a download happens. Mm -hmm. And so, um, again, there are te technological, there's the training of just don't go to places where that are probably hosting malicious software. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you don't know for sure where that is, right? And you may be an engineer who needs to visit a diverse set of websites in order to solve a problem. Right. Like the, the training, and as you said before, the defense in depth is really key. Yeah. So there's different things that you can have, like the inability to run an executable might be one, mm -hmm. but maybe you need the ability to run an executable. So maybe being told that an executable is being run. So there's lots of different ways technically to address waterhole attacks. And a lot of it depends on the risk level of the organization, what it is they're protecting, the person who's doing the work, where do they need to go, what is their actual risk, what is their actual need. Mm -hmm. And that there's not really a one size fits all for that. No, not at all. Which is why it's, it's many times dangerous from a security perspective to just go with a all-in-one package of security and say like, here, here it is. This is, the, this is the golden rule of security and this will make you safe. Right. Because ha half the time it's gonna be either too little security, like it's too permissive, too open, or it's gonna be so secure that it completely stifles your company and you won't have anything valuable to even sell. Right, So being able to do business is important. Yeah. It's that constant um, push-pull between security and and IT that we hear about a lot. Can we make this function? Yes. Is security going to make us not make us function? Well, <laughs> and then you get s some of those really important discussions on what does security look like based on those needs. So, um, all right, another kind of social engineering that probably everyone has heard about because this is generally what training focuses on for organizations is phishing. Mm -hmm. Tell us about phishing. So phishing is phenomenal. Phishing, and it's got a bunch of other, you know, similar things like phishing. Phishing is where you send an email posing as someone else. So it's where you take technology like email and you add pretexting to it in order to get somebody to do something that they shouldn't. So the, you're going to see this everywhere. You open up your spam folder and you're going to have more phishing emails than you can shake a stick at. Right. Uh, they're going to be telling you, uh, hey, we're going to play off of your greed, and I'm a sergeant in Afghanistan trying to exfiltrate this, you know, hoard of gold, and I need somebody on the outside who can help me. Or a more common, like, uh, corporate -y type attack is going to be, hey, I'm the CEO, and I need you to really quickly go get some gift cards for me, because I want to buy some gift cards for a customer. So, um... The Nigerian prince. Uh huh. That's that that greed-based phishing scam. Yep. I mean, these seem so obvious. Yes. It's like, who is going to fall for that obvious of a phishing scam? So it's a really good question, and something that a lot of people bring up, and they say that you know, there's no way that I can get, I I'm going to get caught by phishing because these are so obvious. Well, there's multiple classifications of phishing, and they have different targets, different target audiences. Because let's say that you start to go down the path because uh, it's a fairly clever email. But then you get to the punchline, as it were, where you're supposed to enter in your credentials or something. Or you've been in communication back with this, this adversary and they ask you to send a wire order, or like some money order. And then you stop. You're like, nope, never mind. I don't think that this is legitimate. I'm going to have to do some additional due diligence. Right. Every person that does that is money out of the pocket of the adversary because they had to spend time with oh, you. Oh, okay. Right? Mm -hmm. they, they were emailing you, they were talking maybe on the phone, and for every person who doesn't follow all the way through to the end, 
that's money lost in their minds. Okay. Whether they're coming out of a malicious call center or they're just as an individual entity, they're trying to maximize their profits. So if it is super obvious up front and somebody still falls for it, the chances are good they've got them baited to the end. Mm, okay. So they're, they're purposely making these things dumb and obvious so that they can weed out and really get who their target market is, which are people who really don't understand fishing. Mm -hmm. and, and really don't understand technology, don't understand, maybe are a little credulous, don't know how to protect themselves. Yep. Right. So aside from training, what can we do about those types of situations? Either, f let's say in an organization. Mm -hmm. Let's say we're in an organization, we have uh, a certain, we know that a certain set of people are going to fall for these things, no matter what training we do. Do we, do we change training? Do we increase training? Do we do additional layers of protection in, on the trip? What do you, what do you want to? So at the risk of sounding like a broken record, it's security in depth. That's almost always the answer. You know, for those of you playing along at home, if your security professor asks, it's probably security in depth or probably. <laughs> so uh, those two things will get you through college. Yeah. The, yeah. You really need to have a whole security program set up to cover all of these different components. Training is going to be an absolutely imperative one. We're going to, I want to talk a little bit more about that okay. later. But you also need to know that there are, there are additional technologies and things that you can implement in order to really help out your organization. Um, but first, you really need to know what, what the attack surface is and what's the potential. One of the things that, that I, I just wanted to kind of pause and put a subset of information here is mm -hmm. that a lot of the people who are going to fall for things are people for whom technology is not native. So we're talking about our parents, our grandparents, people in our lives who are not as comfortable with where information should come from to be legitimate. Um, so one of the, the ones that, because it's the beginning of the year, we're talking about... Uh, IRS, right? Tax scams. Uh -huh. And so um, I, I hear a lot of people reach out to me and say, is this legitimate? They'll get a phone call saying, your taxes were not paid last year and you are going to go to jail or you're going to be fined this amount of money. So people are terrified because they think this is real. And then they get asked, give me your social security number, give me your birth date, give me all of these things. And then um, they'll even layer on top of it something like, now, just to prove to you that I am legitimate, I'm going to send you a four-digit code and you give them the four-digit code back, right? Anytime something that is phishing, or in this case, vishing, because it's over, you know, the, over phone. the phone, it, they reach out to you and tell you there's a problem, run away from that. That is not legitimate, okay? Nobody's going to call you and say, you're going to jail. Oh, by the way, give me your social security number, all right? That's not real. So anytime somebody reaches out to you and says, you need to give me your private information and you didn't initiate that call, say, I'm going to actually go to your website or call a phone number. You initiate it, not from anything they give you, but you go do your own research. I'm like, okay, IRS, they seem pretty mad at me. I'm going to hang up on this person or I'm going to ignore this email and I'm going to go directly to the source and find out from the IRS's mm -hmm. site exactly what my status is. And then you can know, because you did your own research, not based on anything somebody was trying to scam you out of. This is what I want everybody to go tell their parents and grandparents right now how to avoid this IRS scam, because it's bad and it's scary and they don't need to have to deal with that. So anyway, that's, that's one way to deal with a phishing scam is to just hang up and then go to the source. But that takes training. It does. Right? And that training can be applied positively or negatively. Like, uh, I like to think of there's Baskin Robbins has 31 flavors, right? right? Security training and security programs have 31 flavors as well. And some of them are really bad and will destroy your company. Yeah. You know, I would like to hear more about that. Like, what, what would you consider good social engineering training or good phishing, since we're talking about phishing? What would you think would be good phishing training as opposed to bad phishing training? Okay. Because the outcome is we want people to change their behaviors because of the training, right? Yes. We want them to not respond to the phishing campaign. So how, how do we get that outcome? So as I said, there's, there's good and bad ways. Uh, you, you asked for both, so let me go with the bad ones first. 
Uh, I've recently heard several anecdotes about different phishing uh, trainings that various companies had um, kicked out that I thought were probably, to put it nicely, suboptimal. Um, in one case, they, they put out a, a, an email to all of the employees, not the customers. For the security team, all of the employees are my customer. Right, so, okay. <laughs> um, they put out an email to all of the employees saying, hey, you're fired. You've been fired. Click here to find out information on your severance package. Well, that's terrifying, like, right? Yeah. <laughs> Emotionally charged, you know what? Makes things real successful when you're in an emotionally charged state because you're not <laughs> thinking straight, right? Mm -hmm. And there is, there's an argument to be, to be made here that, well, attackers can do that, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and that is true. Like, that is a very good point, and attackers will do that. They will put you in an emotionally charged state. As you already said, the IRS calls you, yeah. right? You're already in an emotionally charged state. Um, but you do not want to put yourself on the bad guy list for your employees. And making your work environment a toxic place mm -hmm. is going to do that, you know, 100% of the time. And it's also going to put you in opposition to, you know, like your business purposes as well. Like if you cause people to flee the company, you're going to have a hard time maintaining the job as well. What did you train them to right? do? Leave. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's very much. Or, or perhaps even worse is if you train them to hide mistakes that they make mm, because yeah. you made fun of them or something. Right. Like I've been in conversations where, you know, a security professional has just publicly mocked somebody for doing something incorrectly. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all people. We do funny things. It's right. just kind of part of our genes. Um, but if you humiliate someone yeah. the next time, they're probably just going to hide it. Yeah. You want to be on the good team. You want to be the good guys. You want to be the heroes for your employees, and, and or for your friends if they're yeah, asking sure, the same thing. Sure, sure. Don't. I mean, if you put someone on blast because they made a mistake, um, I have a very good friend who reached out to me and said I almost fell for a phishing scam, and she laid it all out for me, the details of how real it felt and and how emotionally charged it was. Man, I can't remember the details right now, or I'd share them, but. Uh, and I thought about making a blog post out of that. And mm -hmm. then I thought, no, if I do, I need to obscure who this was and, and the situation because otherwise they're not going to come to me when they're unsure next time. Right? They're, not, they're going to make decisions and, and, and not, not reach out to the professionals if the professionals are just going to make fun of them. Yeah. And I mean, that's, a, that's just good advice generally for life, right? <laughs> you want to make friends and influence people, don't be a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. There's your, there's your next shirt. I, you know, I like it. It took me a lot of years to figure that one out, and sometimes I still mess up. But for the most part, I find that, that you can teach people and, and influence them if they believe that you, if you are not just if they believe, but if you're truly their friend. Mm -hmm. If you truly have their best interest in mind, you're not going to be doing these gotcha type phishing campaigns. Yes. I mean, we all, it happens sometimes without realizing that we're, we're testing people unfairly or something, but. Um, for hopefully not in every situation. So, so what's a positive way that we can train people? So give them something that's fairly realistic, real life. Uh, let them, you know, sink or swim based on that and then teach them afterwards. Give them positive reinforcement for making good choices. Uh, good examples of this would be sending out a phishing email that's similar to emails that come to your corporation already. So in my case, it would be, hey, you know, I'm the CEO, as I said earlier, I need your help purchasing these uh, gift cards. Why don't you write me back on, on this address or why don't you text me back on this number and we can, we can discuss the details. If they write back, if they text back, you know, that first step is a semi-fail, mm -hmm. right? Hopefully that scam is well known enough that you don't fall for it. Like mm -hmm. my CEO doesn't do that. He's not. He's not reaching out <laughs> yeah. for people to do that, especially not some random salesperson or engineer. Right. So give them something realistic, and if they do fail, right, mm -hmm. don't don't slap your forehead in front of them. Don't 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 call them out. Don't don't put them on the wall of sheep. Like there's right. a place for that. Yeah. That's DefCon. DefCon. <laughs> At DefCon, there is that where if you your name gets put up, if you um, like 
you leave your Wi-Fi on on your phone, mm-hmm. and somebody pops that device and and you know figures out who you are. Your name goes up there. Um, so, the, but it's a game. Like we mm-hmm. all know that that's a game. Doing that to people in a work situation is just extremely uncomfortable and not very educational. Yeah, yeah. In fact, early on, early on in my career, <laughs> and I speak as though I've, I'm so ancient in my career. <laughs> um, it feels that way sometimes. Uh, Security I, will do that to you. I, it's true. I've got more gray hairs here than... Uh, than I know. Um, I'm 28, so... <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. I believe. Anyway, I, I did a fishing campaign that was, you know, completely approved by everyone. But the manager that I was impersonating as part of the fishing campaign did not know. And I talked to him afterwards. And I said, hey, by the way, this is how this ran down. And I was using your, your image. I was using your email and, you know, your name. And he told me, he's like, wow, I feel violated. Like, we had a great relationship there. Oh, interesting. But he, he brought up the fact that even in this highly controlled situation, he wasn't sure how to process that. Mm-hmm. And so you have to be careful and not abuse people. Because, again, these are humans. They're not... They're not gerbils that you're trying to train. Right. And they will take offense and they've got free will. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, again, looking back at this defense in depth mm-hmm. concept, um, it, it reminds me of uh, I have a friend who is an accountant in a bank. Mm-hmm. And he told me at the beginning of 2020, when I don't know if you knew this, but a bunch of lockdowns happened and people oh. had to work from home. Oh, is that what yeah, happened? That's what happened. And so <laughs> he, he was one of the people, and a lot of the people in the banking industry were working from home, which is a different situation from being in the office. Uh-huh. And it leaves a person, whenever you have a different set of technologies, a different set of processes, that's a, a situation where you can be left open to error um, and phishing attempts mm-hmm. can be more successful, right? Because if you're in an office and you get an email that says, hey, this is the CEO of the bank or whatever, the bank president, and I need you to wire this amount to this group over here. If you're in the bank, you can be like, uh, hey, Joe, did you want us to send this money to the, I just got this email from you, just checking, right? You can do that. Mm-hmm. But you're you know, at home working and it's all virtual and it, it almost becomes more detached and less real. And so just responding to these things or... Again, could have used an emotionally charged situation. He said that at the beginning of the year, their um, uh, number of phishing attacks against individuals of the company um, skyrocketed. It was well over double what they were used to. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the things that uh, you can put in place in a high-risk situation like a bank or or other places where you have some some protected money or information or all of these things, Mm -hmm. having these processes in place that say one single person cannot react to an order and go take care of it. You can't, you can't count the person asking for it and the person executing it as two different people in a high-risk situation. You need a third set of eyes or you need a third, third way of contacting. So you get an email from the, the CEO and then the, the next step is you call them at a number you have, not a number from the email that they mm-hmm. sent. So there's a verification step, right? So having these processes that are well-established and in place can help kind of protect people from themselves instead of just getting that mi- that mindset of, oh, I have work to do. I'm just going to get this work done. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, you've wired $60 million to Venezuela, right? So um, uh, processes and, and checkpoints, I think, are, are one way to do it. What are some other ways that, that can help protect people like a defense in depth to some of these phishing campaigns. So there's also technical, uh, there's technical means that you can apply. Uh, one great thing that everybody should be doing, um, and again, it, it can be complicated, so we're not gonna cover it too much, but you need to have some of the security settings on your domain, like DKIM, SPF, and DMARC. Oh, you all just scared all kinds of people. Yeah, all, all sorts Would of you? things. <laughs> So these are these are three technologies that have been put in place so that you can validate where an email is coming from and whether or not it's authorized. And the email provider, like your Gmails or your Outlooks or you know whatever you've got, they will read that information and say, "Oh, 
This email passes the sniff test, therefore I'm gonna let it go through. This email does not, like it says that it's coming from, you know, goodguy.com, mm -hmm. but you know, the IP address that it came from doesn't match any of those in our list. We're going to throw it into spam or we're gonna flag it as potentially dangerous. Right. So those technologies you can throw in place and it will reduce a lot of the very low level phishing that you would get on your domain. Right, right. So, for example, we, we don't really get um, emails coming from you know, our CEO at, at lucidchart.com. Mm -hmm. Instead, they're coming from you know, my, my spammy spammy place.com and it'll be like you know, CEO at spammy place. Right. And then you know, your email provider gets it and says, hey, this, this doesn't look quite right. We don't let through <laughs> stuff from Spammy Play, so mm -hmm. not going to let that one Yeah, not, not going to let it through or I'm going to flag it as dangerous. On top of that, you can, you can add in a custom gateway, which is kind of like a bodyguard or um, a bouncer, maybe a better image, a bouncer for your email service. And as emails come in, it's a, a secondary check to say, hmm, I've been seeing a lot of emails that look like you, and I know that those were bad. So I'm not going to let you in. Sorry. Yeah. Or I'm going to put you in a quarantine, maybe a man trap, right. transparent <laughs> tube, um, and have somebody else come in and observe and see if you're legitimate. Right. So, so um, uh, another one that I, uh, I like a lot is, um, well, there's ways that you can prevent clicking on links within emails. There are definitely technical mm -hmm. um, solutions for that. It, and if that's an option, that's a, a really good thing to do. Or specific types of um, attachments. Some attachments are more prone to security issues than others. Um, and so depending on, on who you are in an organization, you might not need to get certain types of, of um, attachments. Um, and then there's also um, some of these uh, password managers mm -hmm. where if you go to put in your password, they recognize whether it's the legitimate site or whether it's right. one that to your eye looks like it, but actually there's an I there instead of an L no. and they look really, really similar, <laughs> but they're not the same, right? So, so something like a password manager can help control whether you're actually entering credentials into the correct place or not. Mm -hmm. And I 100% I espouse that. I think that password managers are necessary for not just corporate type settings, but honestly, I mean, uh, everybody, in my opinion, yeah. should be intelligently using password managers. You know, I knew I was in love when I gave my master password manager password to my now husband. Uh-huh. That's, <laughs> that's a lot of trust. Right. That's a lot of trust. <laughs> no, I recommend this to, to people, who, especially people who have um, parents and grandparents who are uncomfortable with technology. Get them a password manager. Set it up for them. Make sure that you help manage it with them. That way they're easily able to log into things and you can help them as, as one of the um, kind of admins on that password manager mm -hmm. account. You can help them to log into things securely and into the right places where they don't have to write the, the passwords down. They can actually have it taken care of for them. And so they're not that expensive. Yeah. And so much of what we've talked about has revolved around the idea of making it really easy to do the right thing. Yeah. You talked about establishing, you know, processes and providing training, that kind of thing, because you want to make it, you want to make that golden path just be absolutely guardrailed so that it's difficult to jump off the side. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so we've covered a lot of really great things about phishing. You mentioned vishing, and we sort of said that's voice phishing. Mm -hmm. So phishing typically comes through email. Vishing usually comes through some kind of a phone line. Um, smishing, I hate that word so much, is a text that you get, like an SMX that, that comes through um, with phishing. My favorite is I've got some guy named Sanchez who has been sending me not very much information. He's going for the curiosity factor. Like, it'll be like, hey, this is Sanchez, and then all of these little emojis and a link. And I'm like, not gonna do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so there are curiosity ones. There are, oh, another one that I've been getting recently is, we have unclaimed money for you. Click here to find out. Again, it's that greed thing that you mm -hmm. were talking about. Um, uh, let's see what else. Oh, you have been exposed to COVID. Click here to learn more. That's 
just rude. Yeah, it, it really bugs me when when an adversary will take advantage of, you know, somewhat devastating yeah. events. Like, as there are people who will comb obituaries yeah. to find victims. Mm -hmm. And, like, that kind of thing, That that's one of the other things that really drove me into security is I wanted to stop the people who would do this mm -hmm. to other people. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, it's... And it's hard to, to recognize all of them right away, but I think there are some, some basic principles, and we touched on them a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. If something makes you go, oh, I could get money, or, oh, no, I'm in trouble, mm -hmm. or I am so angry right now, if you get some kind of unsolicited email or text or phone call that makes you feel a thing, you're going to make really bad decisions. Right? Yep. So the, the first thing that you should do is go, Set that aside so you don't feel the thing and then you can rationally deal with it in a minute. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so set it, set it aside and then look at the authority, like try and establish the authority. You mentioned before, like the IRS calls you and says that you have back taxes, you're gonna go to jail, right? Very, very common. And it happens over email, it happens over, uh, over voice, and it happens over SMS. You need to Again, set it aside, and then look, go to the IRS website, not whatever you know link that they tried to give you yes. in that. So go to the actual authoritative source and get your information from there. Call a phone number from there. You can get to customer support. Also, a good thing to note, if it's the IRS and you call back and they answer immediately, it's probably not the IRS. Because my understanding is you'll probably be on, on hold for, for a very, an hour, an hour and a half. For a very long time. <laughs> also, if it's the IRS calling and saying, we're going to put you in jail, it's not the IRS. They want you out working so you can pay off those back taxes. Right. right? <laughs> there are a lot of steps between, hey, you didn't pay, and oh, you're going to jail. Lots of steps. And one of the other steps that you had actually touched on earlier that I want to make mention again is we've got we all have people that we know and can trust who have a little bit of security experience. Right. Like there's enough of us out in, in yeah. the world, in the industry, that you can afford to go ask them. Right. And, you know, sometimes it might be a little bit uncomfortable. Maybe you're going to be embarrassed, but that's going to be way better than you falling for one of these attacks and becoming extremely uncomfortable and extremely embarrassed. Right. And, and try to be patient with us if the first response we have is to laugh because... I mean, look, kind of socially awkward, right? Mm -hmm. Because the security industry, it's kind of, we don't always have the best responses. Just keep that in mind. So we've, we've come up with some several uh, like security PSAs so far. Uh, are there any that you can think of that, that we've missed that we want to tell people, hey, keep this, uh, keep this in mind? Um, as far as things that uh, I would want you to keep in mind would be, especially if you're in a, security position for like a company mm -hmm. or for other people uh, keep in mind that you are trying to help them not just for the corporate ends like a good company wants to promote its employees help them become better help them to become more safe mm -hmm. so don't just focus on the hey you need to update your windows machines or you need to run these patches right now and make sure you do that asap but also allow security psas to go for things like your iOS devices, your personal devices, they might sure. be vulnerable as well. Yeah. Also, heads up, it is tax season, so make sure that you keep an eye out for you know X, Y, and Z attacks right. personally because they'll come for you. Yeah, because you don't want your employees stressed out because no. they got attacked and suddenly they're dealing with you know having their identity stolen or or money or you know whatever it is. Um, do you know, some of the people who listen to this show are also kind of new to security. They are security professionals, mm -hmm. but um, I know for myself, when I first started into security, what I noticed was that if you ask help and you're a security professional, there's a lot of pressure on you to like not ask for help, mm -hmm. right? Because it, it feels like everybody's going to judge you. Uh -huh. Or um, uh, make fun of you, you know, like that whole, the, the fear of, I guess um, there's so much to know as a security professional that the whole uh, imposter syndrome thing hits us hard anyway. Mm -hmm. And then we have to go, um, I don't understand this one thing. What can we do, though, to, to kind of broaden that conversation and get the help we need 
not just as, as new security professionals, but as any security professional trying to understand more? Well, one of the big things that you want to do is understand that everybody else is in the same boat. Uh, even if they've been in security for 50 years and you know they're very much the top dog in terms of knowledge, um, they don't know everything. Right. And you're not going to know everything. I'm, oh, I certainly yeah. don't know everything. Yeah. Uh, I, even any, even in a fairly concentrated subject like social engineering, mm -hmm. you need to ask for help and don't don't be shy because everybody's been there. Yeah. Nobody started at 50 years of experience. Right. Right. And you know, most of us, I think, in the community are very happy to pay it forward because we've all received help. Right. And. If you are willing to tell somebody at your office or your friends and say, hold on, I don't actually know the answer to that right now, but I think I can find somebody who will and I'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. What you've done is you've essentially opened the door for them even wider to come and ask for help later on. Right. Because you've, you've shown a good example. You've said it's safe mm -hmm. to say I don't know and ask for help. Yeah. Well, uh, before we wrap it up today, is there anything we missed on the, I mean, sh there is a lot that we have missed on social engineering. We can't bring it all into a no single way. conversation, but was there anything else you wanted to touch on before we closed? Um, just this again, don't, don't be embarrassed uh, if, if you feel like you can't handle the whole security program all at once. Nobody can. It's, it's the eating an elephant principle. You need to start someplace and start to work out to make the program better. Uh, you're trying to do this defense in depth, and you never, you don't build all the walls in a castle at the same time. You don't, uh, you start with the core, and then you build outwards uh, a piece at a time. And it's not going to be perfect, and that's okay. Just right. try to do what you think is the most important first. Right. So taking that risk-based approach mm -hmm. that we were talking about earlier, if if you've done a risk assessment, you know what your priority, what's the highest risk, see if you can put priority there. or as you mentioned earlier as well, what is that low-hanging fruit? So maybe highest risk, low-hanging fruit, you've got the beginning of a security program. Yep. Right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Everyone, thank you all for listening. I hope that you have learned uh, a little more something about social engineering. Uh, again, this is the Security Metrics Podcast, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. To watch more episodes of Security Metrics Podcast, click on the box on the left. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. See you on the slopes.